Thanks, Eric. Okay, so I mentioned before that analysis is uh, really GIS coming into its own. It's going beyond the mapping and visualization, as cool as that is, and using compute power and data and smart algorithms to ask questions of our data. And those data sources are becoming richer and richer all the time. Analysis goes from the very simple things such as a buffer or a clip, those kind of more traditional GIS um, operations, into some very sophisticated areas. And that area is advancing very rapidly. One of the areas I want to call out specifically is the AI, so artificial intelligence, specifically the deep learning and machine learning. We've seen a little bit of that so far. We're going to see more of that in the next couple of segments. That data science area really is expanding rapidly, and it's something I'd encourage you to talk to your counterparts in, in other parts of your organization and see what opportunities there are to enable them with these sorts of tools to carry out their work. That same geographic approach thinking about what location can bring to solving problems, put into their hands, whether it's using Excel perhaps, or using some of these web tools we've looked at, is a really powerful way to give them the capability that they need to do their jobs. Another area that's growing, no pun intended, is big data. So big data, um, we're seeing more and more of it coming through, whether it's um, repositories for information that's coming from sensors in real time, or stuff we're doing on the back of analytics. We were in the Auckland event two days ago, and we saw a data set that had 72 billion rows in it. That's a lot. It doesn't fit in a shapefile. So we have to change how we think and we deal with big data, truly big data. The approach in this case, this case is actually to move the analysis to the data set. So with tools like Geoanalytics Engine, we can take the capabilities, those analysis capabilities that we expect to see inside of our ArcGIS tools, and run that within the data set itself. So it's a radical change to how we would do analysis on big data sets, but it's the, the most efficient and effective way to do it. Another area of rapid innovation is in the real-time analytics space. So this is where we're bringing in information which is changing in real time, either through Velocity, which is the SaaS offering, the cloud offering, or through GeoEvent, which is the ArcGIS Enterprise offering, bringing that in with a connector, having triggers happen in real time, tell me when this and this are nearby, tell me when this dot moves outside this geofence, and then capturing the information that's been streamed ongoing so we can do analytics and pattern analysis on the longer trends. Another area that's growing rapidly is link analysis, and Greg mentioned this before, I think, in terms of uh, graph databases. A great way to model your world when you're talking about entities which have relationships, people have relationships, which may or may not be spatial. The ArcGIS knowledge extension to ArcGIS Enterprise allows you to model these entities. It came originally from the intelligence world, but it's got all kinds of applications from pest control to asset management and so on. And we're keen to see how you can use these tools going forward. A key input to the analysis that we're seeing is imagery. We've heard already this morning from Living Atlas about how imagery or raster is kind of the new cool. When I went to university many years ago, raster was the poor cousin of vector, I think. I think that's changed. I think that now with the advent of uh, easily accessible satellite information, drones, aerial capture, uh, oblique imagery, and including the capabilities that we have for analysis and storage of these data sets, raster is now really coming into its own. And it's a really rich, um, source of information that we can do analysis on. To look at imagery in focus, I want to pass across to Baudivain and to Jess. Thank you. Yeah, when we talk about all those workflows and things you can do with imagery, we tend to uh, use the, cat uh, the five categories of five capabilities of imagery, which are the reality mapping, which you can see as the processing of your imagery into 2D and 3D products. Um, you've got the analysis uh, that includes GeoAI, uh, where you can derive information from your imagery. Visualization, as in just some powerful visualization tools to make uh, meaningful information products from um, whatever uh, imagery product you're using. Underpinning all of that is the data management. So whether you're managing uh, small sets of imagery or large sets of imagery, just making sure that it's available to your organization is, is key in being able to use that, uh, that asset. 
And then finally, we uh, describe content. Uh, so that is the content that is available in Living Atlas that I talked about, like the satellite imagery. Uh, it's information that, uh, it, that is available from partners, maybe, that is shared with you, and all of your own imagery layers in your own organization. And so as Badevain said, an important part of working with imagery is the ability to visualize, analyze, and explore that imagery. So we're gonna start with updates to the map viewer first. Uh, we have some new improvements to help you do just that, and they include first off the raster collection explorer and then the raster function editor. Yeah, so in the map viewer, uh, we can explore imagery now. And I talked about how Linz's imagery is available now as an S3 bucket. So what I've done is I've uh, managed it all in a mosaic data set and then published it as an image surface. And once we add that to the map, uh, and here we zoom into New Plymouth, uh, we, I've added that layer. And once I add the layer, the default image is the latest image that is available. But if we look at this layer, there's actually over 430,000 images in this image surface. So having an easy way to explore that imagery is key. And that is um, where you can now use the Raster Collection Explorer. So what it allows you to do, it allows you to filter imagery uh, based on the location or based on an attribute. So in this case, the name, and we can uh, specify a specific uh, data set and get all the imagery uh, for that data set here. Um, if we go back to the defaults, then we can also decide what, Im uh, what information we want to see as we're navigating that imagery. So in this case, I'm uh, choosing the title, but also the flown uh, from date. Uh, what I can do as well is turn on the thumbnail, so you get a little bit of a, of a preview of uh, what the imagery looks like. And then you can sort the imagery. So this is all the imagery that's in view, and I've sorted it with the oldest first, where you can see there's actually some uh, just post my birth date uh, imagery in black and white. Um, and this imagery we can then start using. So we can either select a couple of these images, add them to the map, or we select just one image, add it to the map. And once we've got it in the map, we can just use it as a uh, reference layer. But we can also start doing analysis uh, on this. So whether that's using the raster functions or the raster analysis tools, um, uh, you can start doing the analysis that you like to do, where we have an example of as well. So like Vadovan said, we have explored our imagery and we're ready to analyze. So in this demonstration, we have two digital elevation models from Linz. Uh, one is from 2023 and one is from 2018 to 2020. When we go to our analysis tab, we have heaps of raster functions that we can access. And we want to create a chain though. So we're going to go to our raster function template. And here we can add some functions while staying in our map still. For this instance, we want to compute change. So we'll add that function to it, but then we want to remap the values right afterwards to get losses and gains instead. Once we've added them, we connect them together, and then we choose our data layers. As you can see here, we've made our chain, so we could save it uh, so that we could reuse the exact same steps in other maps or projects. But we're not gonna do it in this example. Instead, we just want to open the template, and we can see those steps chain together. And just by clicking run, run we'd be able to create our layer, which looks a little something like this. Now, as we can see here, we have the loss of elevation in red and the gain of elevation in green. And this is just enabling us to pick up vegetation loss or growth or even the demolition or construction of buildings from 2018 to 2023. Yeah, and this is super powerful. So what we've seen here is data that's being hosted in the cloud, um, products that is a SaaS product, so we didn't need to install anything. And we can do this powerful analysis on imagery um, uh, Without, uh, without the need of installing all that. All right, so another type of imagery is oriented imagery. Um, so for imagery that is looking straight down, uh, nadir or near nadir, we've got the mosaic data set to manage all that uh, imagery. However, what we've seen is that there's more imagery coming in that is looking at the horizon. 
uh, so whether that is from drones for inspections, um, maybe 360 imagery or field inspection imagery. And we need a good way to manage uh, that data. Uh, and that is uh, where the oriented uh, imagery catalog comes in. And this is something that we've uh, been uh, doing for a while, but as a little bit of a side project uh, in ArcGIS. And now what Esri has started to do is integrate it into the software. And why this oriented imagery is so key? Because it allows you to uh, get answers to a question of what images do I have that are looking at this location? And that is different than seeing where an image is taken uh, and clicking on the image to see if it is actually looking at that uh, location that you're interested in. So how it's being integrated at the moment is that in ArcGIS Pro, we've got a toolbox now. So if, it's, if you install ArcGIS Pro, you get the toolbox and you can create an oriented imagery catalog and you can add your uh, images and manage that catalog. It also comes with a ribbon and a viewer to interact with that oriented imagery catalog. You can then use a normal sharing uh, workflow in uh, ArcGIS Pro to make it available in ArcGIS Online. Uh, and from there, you can start interacting with it as well. So in the uh, ArcGIS Online Map Viewer, uh, it will pick up that it's an oriented imagery layer and you get that oriented imagery viewer. The same as in the ArcGIS, uh, ArcGIS Instant App sidebar, uh, where you can now interact with it. And a very easy way to get started with it is through Quick Capture. So if you're interested and you want to get started uh, with this, I would definitely um, recommend going to Quick Capture. So any project in ArcGIS Quick Capture uh, has, that has photo attachments can be enabled for oriented imagery, as you can see here. When you enable oriented imagery uh, in your project, an oriented imagery layer will be automatically created in ArcGIS Law on online or enterprise. And then what it does is it's adding all these different fields to capture that extra meta of metadata that allows you to determine where the image is looking at on a map. And so any photo that's taken with this app would then be automatically uploaded to that layer as a feature attachment. And so just by adding this layer to a map that has the oriented imagery viewer, you can interact with it. Um, and from that map, you can then create an instant app. And an instant app looks a little something like this. We already showed this to you earlier when Fran showed it in her uh, updates to the instant apps. Uh, but we want to emphasize that it, this is the layer that's coming from that Quick Capture project. And another thing that you can do with this app is that, as we kind of showed earlier, you can click around the map and see all the different footprints of what's visual, of uh, what's visible. We also have this little compass here at the bottom. And with this compass, we can find our little inspection point that we need and click on the compass to find other angles where that same photo, uh, where different photos can cover that same exact in, uh, inspection point. And so the idea of this application is that we really want to uh, basically just help you explore your fieldwork images uh, in a way that you can quickly see the images, where they are, and where your point of interest is. Yeah, and uh, going forward, uh, there'll be more announcements in the integration. So one of the things that is going uh, to be added is videos. So being able to uh, ha make videos and use that same oriented imagery uh, capability, that's real powerful. What is going to help us with that is that new for motion imagery is that uh, there's a new ArcGIS image server uh, that you can install with your ArcGIS enterprise. And this is a new role for ArcGIS Enterprise, and it allows you to stream video, um, both recorded as live streams. So once uh, you've got it set up, you can uh, manage search and discover videos, and you can analyze it using things like uh, object detection. So at this release, um, you need a client for it. So the clients that uh, can leverage this is ArcGIS Pro, it's ArcGIS All Source, and ArcGIS Excalibur. And what you can do then is you can start to annotate this imagery. So in ArcGIS Excalibur, which is a project-based application um, that allows you to discover the content, not just your videos, but also your oriented imagery and all of the imagery that, you've, uh, that you're managing uh, in your organization. Uh, and you can share results of your analysis then as easy, uh, through easy tools and workflows. 
So what you can do is things like annotating uh, or marking up your imagery, uh, adding as, uh, observations or measurements to your video, and then return those as results in a dashboard or a report. Uh, so this is a real powerful combination that is uh, available now that we can uh, start using to leverage all of that video that is being captured by organizations. So one of the sources of those videos uh, and actually oriented imagery is from our drones. ArcGIS Reality is a suite of reality mapping tools that scale all the way from small sites or buildings with a drone to airplanes over towns, uh, all the way up to satellite imagery over entire cities and basically the world. All four of these products, though, are tied together by the four imagery products that they all produce, which is our digital service models, our true orthos, point clouds, and then our 3D meshes. And so all these four apps, while they all represent different scales, they all create the same things. And so unfortunately, we don't have the time to detail every single update uh, in each one of these applications. Uh, this is a, a very nice summary slide, uh, but the point that we want to get across is that all four of these applications are being updated uh, constantly to try to give you the best and most efficient version of those four products. Uh, they all are using now the same engine, which is the rea reality engine. So that engine is continually improving to make the most high accuracy and realistic products that we possibly can. I would like to note that one really exciting thing though that has come out is that now we can turn satellite imagery into digital surface models as well as in 3D integrated meshes. And that was our imagery session, thank you. Thank you very much, Baudivain and uh, Jess. So imagery, yeah, raster is the new, the new cool, I would argue. And yeah, as uh, mentioned before, the guys are around at lunchtime, so please come and chat to Baudivain or Jess about any imagery questions. <clears throat> Another cool topic, a rapidly evolving topic, is the one of artificial intelligence. So AI is in the news almost every day, and we, what we thought we'd cover a little bit of where AI fits into the world of ArcGIS, into the familiar tools and applications that you use every day. One key point is to differentiate the two main areas of artificial intelligence within ArcGIS. The first of those is GeoAI, Geographic Artificial Intelligence. And this is a set of tools and capabilities which are rapidly evolving to carry out GIS analysis and data work within ArcGIS primarily within the web and pro, but also elsewhere. So this is using things like deep learning models to extract information from imagery. Separate to that is assistive or assistance AI. And these are a set of tools, as we saw in the Survey123 example, where large language models are perhaps being applied to allow it to take your words and to translate that into scripts or text to help you create applications which will run inside your ArcGIS environments. So when we're talking about GeoAI, it can do a whole bunch of things. It can see information, it can analyze it, it can learn from information which you provide to it, it can read text and other things. It can also create in the form of GenAI. GenAI isn't the follow-on to Gen X and Gen Y. GenAI is generative AI, so it's creating new information from existing information. So that's GeoAI, and we'll see some more of that very shortly. But alongside that is this assistance AI. This is a less matured area within ArcGIS, but nonetheless is getting a lot of uh, focus from the development team at Esri. And they're really keen for feedback, actually. What are the areas that you think would benefit most from having assistive AI inside ArcGIS? Is it navigating the help? Is it debugging and finding issues with your scripts? This is really tools that are aimed at helping GIS professionals. <clears throat> In this diagram here on the right, we've got a set of areas where we think Gen AI, uh, sorry, assistive AI could be useful to GIS professionals within the applications themselves. But the other area for application is really outside of our GIS users, maybe aimed at the public, maybe a generative AI, uh, sorry, assistive AI view on ArcGIS Hub, where they would ask questions like, what day will my bins be collected? It's doing point and polygon analysis on the back end and giving you a result in text. We think that's a really exciting space, which Ezra are working on right now. Going back to the GeoAI world, pre-trained models are a key part of our work in this area for deep learning. Models that have been trained on existing imagery to learn and then to be replicating that, those learnings to find 
objects within other images, for example. There's a number of pre-trained models available, 72 in fact, from Esri and Eagle, as well as from other distributors and contributors around the planet. We do encourage you to check those out. One of those is SAM, or um, Segment Anything Model from Meta. To show how that's being used along with the object detection models, I want to pass across to Eagle's GeoAI uh, Geo lead, Edward. Thanks, Scott. So just a quick recap, this is what we have seen at um, our New Zealand user conference last year. This is a um, multi-class objects that's, op that's got extracted from the area imagery. So the magic under the hood is we are combining all the New Zealand's models and we want to detect all the objects separately. Then we'll merge it with the segment anything models. And this will use the results of what we have seen previously. But this is not where we stopped. We have extended it so that there's the text and models that can be used right now. So one of the main benefits of text and models is it leverages the zero-shot detections technology. So with this approach, the models can now detect objects that even it have never seen before in the training data. So I'm gonna, the best way to see it is through a demo and a live demo. First, this is the oriented imagery that's uh, from an iPhone through Quick Captures. And this is in Wellington. So if we change, if we update the text prompt to circular objects or a manhole, this is what um, the models will return, a segmented object. So this is just a quick sample, uh, quick examples of what it can do for us. But taking it, looking at it from a different angles, now we are looking at area imagery at uh, Topo. Taking a closer look, the next thing that we will want to do is if I go to history, I can show you how I can use detect object using deep learning tools, and I can set the text prompt to car, and I will be able to extract this cars out from this imagery. Now I can repeat the same workflows to extract the buildings. I can extract the trees. But it seems like this text and models is only extracting the bigger tree. If we take a closer look at the environments tab, we can see the cell size has been set to We can see the cell size has been set to 0 0.3. Now, I want to update that to 0 0.1. So that means that will take 10 centimeters. And now you can see the models is extracting most of the trees from the imagery, or even all that exists on this imagery. So, this is not just showing how the tools can be used to extract the features in an automated way, but also it can run in scale as well. In just one minute, it can extract all these 2,000 features for me. Well, we also understand that not all of the users have a um, machines with graphic cards, so you can also bring this workflows to the clouds. Knowing that the same models it's available on ArcGIS living at this, we can use ArcGIS imagery for ArcGIS online. This we have already loaded the tile imagery um, layers. We can go to analysis, use the tools, and I want to use deep learning to detect object using deep learning. Now I'll be able to select the layers that I want to run it on which is the imagery layers, and then I can select the models. When I, I can go to Living Atlas, and then I will search for text, not test, and I can select this and confirm. So now the tools will start querying the arguments, but I've preluded it over here. So what we have to do is just update the text prompt to buildings, 
we can estimate the credits, we can set the cell size to the right numbers, and then we can hit runs. This will take a few minutes, but it will give you a result like this, where all the buildings it's extracted out. And can go to the history and look at the parameters and the times that's used to get this result. In just four minutes, we can get all the buildings out for Topos. So we have seen how the AI models and the technologies is ready to be used. So when it will empowers everyone, it's when you're ready to use this, to leverage these capabilities on your daily workflows. Back to you, Scott. Thanks, Edward. <laughs> okay, so that concludes the technology demonstrations. Um, hopefully it's given you a sense of the innovation that's happening in ArcGIS and the tools that you use every day. Of course, the innovation doesn't stop today. It's ongoing all the time. And there's a number of key areas that the Esri development team are focusing on, including in these AI spaces around the GeoAI and then also the assistive AI. Alongside the technology, um, Esri's work and our work is to support you in your various endeavours, whatever that is. We're excited over the series of these rocks to see the various applications that you and your colleagues around the country are applying GIS to, and that's what we look forward to this afternoon. Our job is to support you to do that work, for example, through professional development, providing courses and education and training so you can keep up, to keep, us, keep up skilled with the latest advancements in these kinds of technology. To support you guys in times of need, training and preparation for disasters is just as important as how you respond in time of need. We've got a specific uh, focused area with EM support to provide support to you guys in times of need in a best efforts basis. Please do check out our hub site and also the EM support uh, email alias there. <coughs> Education, not just for yourselves, but for the next generation of GIS professionals is vitally important at universities and also at schools. Most schools, most high schools now in New Zealand do have access to ArcGIS, which is fantastic, including my son, who's got a story map assignment to do this week and he's asked for help, but I think his skills are ahead of mine already. Finally, we talk about how GIS can be used in a variety of areas. Conservation is one we want to pull out specifically. It's vitally important that we make a good efforts in the space of conservation and apply the best technology we have. This is a global effort supported by ESRI and locally by us in New Zealand. And I want to just shout out to all those of you right now who do volunteer your time to assist with GIS and conservation. And we'll be hearing a bit of an update in terms of the work that's being done from this group uh, after lunch. Finally, I want to thank all of you for your time today. For, thank you for bearing with us. We're a bit over time. Uh, hopefully, it's been a useful update. If it's been useful today, then we look forward to seeing you in the future, uh, the not too distant future, in September, again in Wellington. We're bringing the New Zealand Ezra User Conference to a uh, beautiful, still smells like fresh paint, Takina Event Centre just down the road. And we look forward to seeing as many of you there as possible, including to hear your own stories. On behalf of the team at Eagle, thank you very much for your time and looking forward to seeing the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emma Hiana, uh, he, uh, yeah, our team here at Eagle Technology for all your work. I know it takes a lot of mahi to put all of this together. Um, so yeah, we'll just give them uh, one more round of applause, please. And I know many of us will be taking a lot of these updates home with us uh, and yeah, investigating them in our own organisations uh, ourselves. Particularly excited about the object oriented imagery. That stuff's really cool. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. And we'll be exploring many of these themes uh, throughout the rest of the, the uh, sorry, this afternoon. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, we'll swap over uh, and kind of shift our focus.